Hey everybody, welcome. We're gonna get started, so. I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Terry Johnson. He has a master's degree in chemical engineering from MIT and is currently teaching bioengineering at UC Berkeley. He hopes that by doing so, he will be giving students the tools that they will need to repair him as he gets older. He teaches courses on a wide range of subjects, displaying a versatility that, he, that has prevented him from achieving any actual expertise. In 2010, he received the Golden Apple Award for Outstanding Teaching and was one of the recipients of Berkeley's 2013 Distinguished Teaching Awards. He's also co-author of the popular science book, How to Defeat Your Own Clone, and other tips for surviving the biotech revolution. So with that introduction, I'd like to welcome Terry Johnson. Thank you. Give me a second to mic up here. Glad I'm wearing a vest. I need the pockets. Okay, um, so uh, my name is Terry Johnson. Is this volume good? Can everyone hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about academic narratives. And this is from the famous quote, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. Uh, I want to talk about academic narratives as they relate to our everyday life. Um, and this, could I have a show of hands? How many people are postdocs? Graduate students? Undergraduates. All right. With the graduate students... Um, we would say at MIT, you're either a first year, a second year, or an nth year. How many nth year graduate students? How many first or second year graduate students? Excellent, thank you. Okay, I just want uh, to get an idea. Um, so the first part of this talk is going to give you an idea of an academic narrative that most of you have probably already overcome. Um, and in fact, it's very easy to move past it without really knowing that it was there. Uh, and then we'll talk more about academic narratives that I think... Uh, many of you are sort of uh, soon to or already in uh, a, a place where you need to really be aware of these things. So first off, research narratives. Um, how many people have written a paper? How many people have given a talk? Okay, so you're all liars. <laughs> this is what a research narrative looks like. Research is presented always through a narrative. And if you take a look at the basic structure of a paper, it is a story. Um, and I'm going to take this, uh, take a, a story that most people are aware of, either through the movies, The Hobbit. There's an introduction. In the hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. I'm just telling you what the world is like. I'm telling you what's been done in this discipline. I'm telling you uh, what is known and what is unknown. Uh, results in discussion. We killed the dragon. Here's the body. Methods. An arrow. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Conclusion. We're all rich but not wise. Right? There's a story that you tell with your paper. Another word for narrative is lie. All of your papers are lies. So are mine. Not in terms of the data, not in terms of your conclusions, but in terms of how you represent them. Uh, nobody actually says... Uh, when they're talking, let's say you're giving a research talk, they don't come up and they go, well, let me spend, let's say, three of my precious 12 minutes talking about all of the dumb ideas that we had. And that took us a year to move past before we actually got to the hypothesis that we're interested in. Everyone instead goes, so my lab and I got together and we were considering results from blah, 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 uh, and also yada, yada. And we decided, well, really? There's a hypothesis, and it turned out to be true. <laughs> it was the first hypothesis that we had, so far as you know. <coughs> and amazingly, the other nine minutes of the talk will be devoted to proving how brilliant we were to have that hypothesis. Uh, there's a, uh, this is, I, I don't have a citation for this, unfortunately, because it's just been posted all over the Internet, but uh, the public perception of science and the perception of science as given in a talk are very similar. Um, you think about something, you decide you're going to work on it, you do some reading, you do some science, and you get your Nobel Prize. And I think most of you have already realized that even though you hear this given in a talk, it's not true, and you don't expect it to be true. Part of the culture is realizing that it's actually more like this.
You're all aware of that, right? And you're probably all aware of that despite the fact that nobody has ever sat you down and said, oh, by the way, uh, this is actually what we mean. When you give a talk, you lie, right? You actually say, um, you sweep all of this stuff under the rug because it's confusing. You have a limited amount of time to reach your audience, so you're going to construct a narrative which is comprehensible and is going to get across the most important things that you want to get across in the limited amount of time that you have to get them across. Research narratives are constructed to meet a need. They are constructions. What actually happened is the scaffolding, right? You don't spend a lot of time talking about the scaffolding of your research. The cul-de-sacs that you went down that turned out to be not so interesting, uh, the mistakes that you made, I mean, nobody in a talk goes, and it turns out I added the wrong amount of buffer. I did that for four weeks. That was a month that sucked, right? <laughs> nobody does that because why would you do that, right? Career narratives. I think that this is something that we, uh, the many people in this room are probably more focused on. And what I'm going to argue is that these are as artificial, if not more artificial, than research narratives. Now, the thing to realize about research narratives is many of you probably, when you first saw your first couple of research talks, were terrified, right? Because if you look at the research talk, you have to live up to the standard of the research talk. And you think that if I am not a person who makes a hypothesis and then goes out and proves it immediately, that I might not be very good at science, right? You can very easily come to the same conclusion in terms of career. Uh, how many people recognize this? Okay, the, uh, this is famously sort of exemplified by Joseph Campbell. This is the hero's journey. If you were to take a look at mythologies from all over the place, they share, or the argument is that they uh, uh, have a lot in common. And this is sort of like the typical hero's journey. Um, there's a call to adventure. You receive some sort of supernatural aid. Uh, there's a guardian at the threshold that you have to pass. Um, you pass the threshold, you meet a helper, um, who's maybe a minor character, a mentor who's more important. Often there's another helper. There's a, a point of revelation um, where you, know, you meet death or you meet change. Um, you transform as a result of that revelation. Uh, there's often a, a period of atonement based on an error that you made or something that uh, uh, something that you failed at doing at the moment of revelation, and then a return, and then there's the call to adventure all over again. This is sort of like the cycle of the heroic journey. And if you were to look at mythology, you can very often map it to this. Um, and you may have actually seen uh, this applied to the Star Wars movies. Evidently, George Lucas was a big fan of this. I am going to say that the uh, entirely self-serving uh, career narratives that people construct look exactly like this too, because it works. Uh, in engineering, we played with Legos. That's how it all starts. Everybody says, I took things apart when I was a child, or I built things with Legos. Uh, and then there's some supernatural aid, which is usually a teacher, maybe in high school or in middle school, who really supported someone's interest in science. Uh, and there's a threshold guardian, which is applications to graduate school. So I applied to a bunch of graduate schools. And because this is a, my career narrative, and I'm going to try and make myself sound amazing, I'm going to talk about how challenging it was and all of the great places I got into. But I ended up choosing to go to the fancy graduate school uh, that I will emphasize throughout the rest of my talk. Um, while I was there, I worked with a senior graduate student who I will tell you is now faculty, just to give you an idea of the pedigree that I'm putting forward. Um, but I have a very fancy PI as well, and you should know that. So I've been working, I started working with this senior graduate student who went to do what I wanted to do. I worked with this very fancy PI. I have an even fancier collaborator <laughs> that I should mention, uh, and uh, that's somebody who uh, I forged the relationship with, right? So you should realize that about me. Um, <laughs> then there's a revelation, and this is the postdoc, right, where I actually start owning my own research. Right? I, I, at least that's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, the postdoc where I decided the direction of the research and I was writing the grants and I was really sort of taking in the reins. There's a transformation, which is my first major grant. Right? Uh, there's atonement, acknowledgement. But really, acknowledgement is just a way to say, look at all the people that I manage. <laughs> Finally, a faculty offer and tenure. This... There's a reason why this is a good story, and there's a reason why 
Everybody's career narrative sounds exactly like it. Typical academic career narrative emphasizes intention, uniqueness, and inevitability. Intention, you pretend that you meant to do this. At every step, I was planning ahead. How many people have seen Sherlock, the British one? Right? That's how you pretend in a career narrative that you treated your career. I was seeing 17 steps ahead, right? Or if you want to go with the Sherlock in the movie where he thinks about punching people like 38 steps ahead and then he goes and punches the person like that, that's how you pretend your career goes. First, I will go to this graduate school. After graduating from there, I will do this. And you pretend that you meant to do everything that happened in your career. Uniqueness. Um, so many great things about me that there cannot be anyone possibly like me or as good as me. Um, and inevitability. I must be the person who can do this because who else is better positioned to work in this area than I'm working in? Um, is a lie. Career narratives are lies. Uh, and I will give you an example. We'll talk about mine. Uh, this is very commonly seen um, all over the place. In fact, it's so commonly seen I can't actually get an original citation for it. Uh, it's seen um, a lot of times in B-school type materials. This is how we talk about our careers. This is what our careers actually look like. So uh, I, in my original training, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, and why did I choose chemical engineering? If this were a typical career talk, I would talk about chemical engineering because I prognosticated how important it would be to the problems I was working on in the future, which would be bullshit. Uh, what actually happened was I liked math, I liked chemistry, I liked physics, I couldn't choose, choose between them, so I decided I'd do chemical engineering because it seemed like a mix of all three, whereas in reality it's this. <laughs> That's what chemical engineers actually do. I got lucky. It turns out I liked chemical engineering. I did not know what I was getting into, but I still liked it when I got into it. Uh, so after I graduated and during, um, during the sort of last year I was working uh, as an intern, I went to school in Detroit. So you go to one of the big auto companies. This is the General Motors sort of classic building. Uh, and I worked in environmental engineering because that's who was hiring, right? Uh, and my experience was pretty much like this working for General Motors in the late 1990s uh, was not the most interesting place to work. If I'd known, I would have loved to work in the paint shop because they were doing some really interesting research there. I was doing mostly permitting work, right? Um, so I might leave this out of a career talk or I might pretend, I could say, well, you know, I wrote a number of mathematical models of, uh, uh, which, which ended up really feeding in to the work that I ended up doing and it didn't. Right? It was just something different that I did, and I decided I didn't like it, and I moved on. Uh, I could weave this into my career narrative. It would be 97% BS. Uh, so I eventually went to graduate school at MIT. This is Prometheus, uh, the Greek titan, um, punished by Zeus for giving fire to humanity, uh, a chain to a rock for eternity, and every day an eagle would come and peck out his liver, and liver would regenerate. Um, I use this for a couple of reasons. One, while I was there, I was working on a, a liver regeneration uh, project. Uh, but also, graduate school often feels a lot like that. So I was working on liver tissue engineering, um, but I was using fundamentals from separations, right? Like, I went to a very traditional undergraduate chemical engineering education, um, and I'm not going to pretend to you that when I started in chemical engineering, which I chose for the wrong reasons, that I went, well, I'm really here. Because in about 10 years, there's going to be a field that will call upon these fundamentals that doesn't really exist yet. I know that I'm going to be able to use separations and transport and kinetics and thermodynamics to do tissue engineered organs. That's crap. I did not know that. My choice of a major prepared me for a bunch of problems that I had no idea existed, and very few people did, right? When I was there, um, I was working on delivery systems for polymers. So I would basically, we took this star polymer system that uh, the graduate student before me worked on, and the idea was we could use this uh, to bind um, growth factors to a surface and see if growth factors on a surface acted different from the same growth factor floating around in solution. So I had this system, and I came in. I'm going to do a bunch of work 
like math and models and tested on all these things, and that totally did not work at all. It had been developed, it worked for the one thing that it had been developed for, was an utter failure for everything else that I wanted to do with it. So I flailed around like most people do for a year, uh, and I eventually found someone who was working on something similar, which was a cone polymer, which I basically uh, tried a bunch of things that didn't work, finally found someone who was working on something that might work, uh, and we took this and we attached epidermal growth factor to surfaces, and we found out that epidermal growth factor in solution, if you put PC12 cells on it, will just uh, EGF in solution just makes them grow, but EGF tethered to the surface at the same basic concentration makes them differentiate. Like that's that's what I did, and at that point I went, yes, that's a master's degree, I'm done. Um, but this ended up leading to a patent because my complete and utter year of failure demonstrated that there weren't a lot of good materials capable of dealing with the problems that I was dealing with. Uh, and I, as you can see, I'm one of many people on this patent because I was doing a lot of the protein work. Um, this is the first check that I got for the patent. I will zoom in. <laughs> I took my patent and I drank it. <laughs> but here's what I want to note. My failure to make that original system work is what led to that patent. And that patent is now used for filters, something that we were not thinking at all. We were focused mostly on medical technologies, right? So the patent that I only got because I failed by realizing nothing else could work is now very useful in ways that I had absolutely no idea it would be applied, which sounds great in a job talk, right? I, I, like, I, I'm not, I'm not, if I were giving a job talk, I would talk about this very differently because I don't want you to hire me because I got lucky a couple times. Uh, so uh, I graduated. I was in the PhD program. I decided to leave with a master's degree. I was deciding what to do next. Um, I'd done some mathematical work uh, in a little bit in my thesis. Um, I ended up teaching two semesters uh, at MIT for um, a sort of an undergraduate numerical modeling class, a little bit of statistics. These were the sorts of math that I would pretend in a job talk that I was really focused on. What I was actually focused on at the time was this. I had a half-time job teaching at MIT, and I was looking for a full-time job because they pay more money. And I looked mostly in chemical engineering because that was my background. I was a chemical engineer before MIT had a biological engineering program. So uh, I couldn't find a chemical engineering program. But there was a bioe program that was hiring here at Berkeley uh, in 2000. Uh, and I started in 2001. So the honest answer is that my failure to secure a full-time job in chemical engineering is what led to an exciting career that I very much enjoy in bioengineering. This is the reality of a career talk. Uh, and you'll very rarely hear them, and certainly not by anybody who's floating around the circuit giving job talks, right? Narratives are really useful. Um, I like this quote, a story is a trick for sneaking a message into the fortified citadel of the human mind. We use narratives to get messages across. And because attention is very finite, we usually have very small amounts of time to get a message across, right? So we lie. But culturally, we know it's a lie. With research, everybody here knows it's a lie, right? Everybody here knows that, that what they present is not a journal of their activities. It's a narrative that they construct to get information across. The same thing is true for the career narratives. But it's important to realize insiders know that the narratives are artificial. You realize it because you've been inculcated by the culture, right? Outsiders do not. And very often, outsiders internalize these narratives and measure themselves accordingly. I don't know how many of you. It certainly happened to me. I was an undergraduate. I, I don't know that these are lies. I think that this is how scientists work, and I don't work this way, right? And until I actually realized that these were lies, I was measuring myself to these ridiculous heights of glory that no one has ever attained, the lies that are our research narrative. Career narratives are the same way. And I think the message that I want to give for people that are thinking about career, um, it's fine to lie. We understand that you're going to try and put your best foot forward. You don't lie about what skills you have, right? You don't lie about what you've done, but you're allowed to sweep under the rug the terror and panic that you have experienced while doing them. 
because everybody does. Um, one major consequence of this, uh, this is uh, imposter syndrome for those of you who've heard, um, what you know and what you think other people know. By measuring yourself against other people's narratives, you're always going to fail, right? Because those narratives are purposeful. You know all of the warts on your career and research. You may not know them on others. Um, and I also want to sort of end before I want to begin a discussion uh, by talking about the damages that narratives can do. We've talked about people sort of measuring themselves against narratives, but there's a very specific example that came out in a paper recently um, uh, in Science by Leslie in 2015. So what we're going to do is we're going to send out surveys, and we're going to get a measure of the emphasis on brilliance in your discipline. How important is it to be brilliant to succeed in your discipline? And we're going to plot this against, oh, let's say the percentage of women in that discipline. And it looks like that. And every independent measure of the quality of the women who are applying to these programs says that there's no difference in quality on any of these disciplines. No statistically significant difference in quality of applicants. No difference in the selectivity of these programs in reality. But they have a narrative, and that narrative is that you need to have some sort of special, internal, inborn thing to succeed in this program. And how that expresses itself is in random, stupid exclusivity. That's a harmful narrative. Doesn't help the discipline, certainly doesn't help people that are working in the discipline. You can see the same thing if you're talking about percentage of PhDs who are African American. And again, I really want to emphasize, this has nothing to do with the actual quality of the candidates who are applying to these programs. And that's demonstrated in the paper. It's that this narrative lets people, they drink the Kool-Aid. They think that they're special because they're in physics. And you need to be special to be in physics. And if you're not in physics, I don't have to worry about that. Because I can write you off as just not special. Which is dumb. <laughs> 